How are we doing? Well, it is a joy to get to be back with you guys. Uh, man, our church loves your church so much. Uh, my, my wife and, and uh, three of my four kids are up in East Lansing this morning, and um, I brought my son with me. He's, he's in kids' ministry hanging out, so he's pumped because they got dinosaurs in kids' ministry over there. So he was, he was like, dude, Dad, you got to see this, um, naming all the dinosaurs and stuff. But, man, we love you guys and uh, love seeing what God's doing here. And, uh, you know, two, two years in or almost two years in to see a room uh, this full of people is just incredible in the summertime uh, when, when students have vacated and, you know, all the Michiganders are going up north and, and uh, hanging out at their cottages and stuff. So, uh, man, glad to be here. Um, if you got a Bible, yeah, I, th- I think you're already up to S- uh, Psalm 32. So, uh, I uh, actually, I got to say this. We were talking after this. We're going to go to lunch and uh, got to find a good burger. So, can you just tell me really quick, best burger place in Ann Arbor? Frida's? Is that like a just across the, I see somebody shaking their head back there. You disagree? Squeeze in. What did you say? Squeeze in. Squeeze in. Have y'all, can y'all vouch for that, squeeze in? Everybody's like, bro, we never heard of that before. <laughs> I think Frida's wins. Frida's wins, okay. Am I going to be able to get in or are we going to have to wait for a long time? Might have to wait? All right. So I'm 32. Well, uh, uh, so a few weeks ago, um, I had to have my appendix taken out. Anybody had that happen? You had your appendix out? Man, it's not fun. Wasn't planning on it. Uh, so here's kind of how it went down. This was a couple weeks ago. I, it was a Friday, and uh, I was uh, at, at my house, and uh, my, my, my two boys, we just moved them into the same room. I got, I got, so I got four, four kids, six-year-old, four-year-old, three-year-old, one-year-old. And uh, my six-year-old, my three-year-old, two boys, uh, had a bunk bed. The bunk bed was not working out, not a good thing. And so we took the bunk bed apart. We got them two twin, twin beds. So I was putting the twin beds together. And about halfway through, uh, my stomach started to just kind of feel, I'll, I'll be honest, it, I, I, I had some enchiladas the night before, and I thought the enchiladas were kind of messing with me. And so, uh, you know, I just wasn't feeling great. I was like, all right, well, I'm going to get these beds done and deal with this later, you know? And so I finished the beds and, uh, and still wasn't feeling good. In fact, feeling a little bit worse. Nothing crazy, but just wasn't feeling great. And so uh, I had to take our kids to swim lessons. They're in swim lessons right now. And, uh, and I told my wife, I was like, man, I'm not feeling good. And she's like, well, get over it. We're going to swim lessons. And so I uh, hop in the car, and we get to swim lessons. By the time we get there, I'm like, babe, I'm just going to sit in the car. Like, I'm not, I'm not feeling good. And she's, like, pretty frustrated, kind of annoyed, like, quit being a baby. You know, you just got gas or something. And, and uh, so she gets all four kids out of the car herself, gets them into swim lessons. And, and so I just, I just sat there in the car. And it just kept getting worse. Again, it's not like terrible pain, but I was like, man, something, I, you know, if it was gas, I'm like, can we, can we just get it out of there? And it wasn't going anywhere. And so I know it's too much for a sermon, but that's part of the story. So anyways, swim lessons are over and uh, we get back home and we get home around 4.30, which five o'clock, that's dinner time in our house. Um, we eat the same time, you know, your grandparents do. And, uh, and I, just, I just went up to our bedroom and I laid in bed. And again, my wife, you got to know this about Leslie. She's like the most compassionate human on the planet. Um, she's like the most hardworking mother on the planet. And she was super ticked at me uh, because she's getting dinner ready and she's got all four kids and they're fighting and it's the end of the day and they're exhausted. And, and so it's chaos downstairs and I'm laying in the bed and, uh, and she thinks I'm being a baby over some enchiladas that I ate the night before. And so finally, it's been three hours of this and I'm like, I think I need to go see what's going on because something's not right. And so I go downstairs and I was like, babe, I think I need to go to the, to the ER or urgent care or something. And she's like, seriously? As the kids are like going crazy and she's, you know, cooking dinner. And I'm like, babe, I just don't feel good. And she's like, fine, do what you need to do. Just like that. Fine, do what you need to do. And so uh, I just left and drove myself to the ER. And, uh, and so I get to the ER and I, I go to check in, and, and, and seriously, this is how I checked in. I said, I said, look, the lady at the front desk, I was like, look, I think, I might, I think it might just be the enchiladas that I ate last night. Like, I think I might just have the world's worst case of gas or something, but I, can you just check to make sure it's not something else? And she kind of laughs and gets me checked in. And, and so I sit there, they get, they, you know, they get me checked in and pulled back, and, and they say, hey, we're going to do a CAT scan because we think it might be your appendix. And so they do this CAT scan. They said it's going to be about an hour to get the results. And I'm sitting there, and I'm gonna be honest with you, I'm like conflicted in my prayer. I'm like, man, I, I don't want it to be my appendix, but I also don't wanna be sent home and go home to my wife and say, yeah, they told me it's just bad gas, you know? And like, she'd be like, see, you know, even more mad at me. So, 
Uh, about 45 minutes go, goes by and the doctor comes in and she's like, well, looks like you're gonna have some surgery today because it's your appendix. And I'm like, yes, you know. <laughs> so I call Leslie and I'm like, babe, I'm having surgery. It's my appendix, baby. And she's like, oh my gosh, I feel so terrible. And she's like, I'm gonna come to the ER right away, you know. And so she's like sad and stuff. And, and so, uh, you know, that, that, that night they transferred me to the hospital and um, now I'm starting to get bills for it, and you know they're like in the thousands, and um, so that's not fun. But I got my appendix, uh, uh, my appendix taken out the next morning. So why am I telling you this story? Well, I, I've told I've told our church, you know, I got to start being more careful what I'm preaching on. And I preached, as David said, on Psalm 32 a few weeks ago. This was the le- the week leading up to Psalm 32, and I've told our church I got to be, start being more careful because it always works out as I am preparing to preach on a passage. The Lord seems to always like do something in my life to help me better understand what we're studying. Uh, Because he's got to do the work in me before uh, I think I'm able to effectively communicate it to you. And so why am I sharing this story? It's because this this morning we're talking about what do we do with our sin? Do we confess our sin or do we conceal our sin? And undealt with sin in our life is a lot like an infected appendix. If, If you've ever had appendicitis, you know how painful it is. You know how serious it is. You also know how different the outcomes are if you ignore it versus if you tell somebody about it. And similarly, man, undealt with sin in life, it's painful, it's serious, and the consequences of concealing it are great and could even be deadly. And I just wanna be honest with you this morning. So I I think this message might be one of the most important that I preach all year. Um, I, I, I really do wonder how many in this room right now are holding on to unconfessed sin on the inside, just dying on the inside. Like I've been thinking about this a lot leading up to this message um, and, and since preaching it the first time, like been thinking about this a lot. Like I, I imagine there's a lot of people in here right now who you're living in the constant state of fear. Like you're living in the constant state of disgust or even like in the constant state of self-hatred because of sin in your past, or let's just be honest, sin that's maybe very much part of your present now, and you hate it, you regret it, Uh, you're disgusted by it, you're ashamed of it. Let me just tell you what I'm praying this morning, and you're not gonna like what I'm praying for, but here's my prayer. My prayer is that, man, for for those of you, you've got this sin in your life that you've worked really hard to, to like just push out of your view. You've worked really hard to numb yourself to. And maybe you've successfully numbed yourself to the sin in your life. Uh, I'm praying that God would just bring all of that back to the surface of your life this morning so that you can feel it, so that it hurts. Because then, as he brings it to the surface, and I show you what Psalm 32 says, my, uh, says, uh, my hope is that then you'd be able to see what you can have if you bring it to the light and take it to the Lord. So Psalm 32, that's where we're gonna be, and and Aaron just read it. I, I wanna read it again, and then we'll chop it up. So... Psalm 32, starting at verse one, if you got it, let me hear you say, I got it. So verse one, it says, blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity and in whose spirit there is no deceit. For when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night, your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. I acknowledged my sin to you And I did not cover my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Therefore, let everyone who is godly offer prayer to you at a time when you may be found. Surely in the rush of great waters, they shall not reach him. You are a hiding place for me. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with shouts of deliverance. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. Be not like a horse or a mule without understanding, which must be curbed with bit and bridle, or it will not stay near you. Many are the sorrows of the wicked, but steadfast love surrounds the one who trusts in the Lord. Be glad in the Lord, and rejoice, O righteous, and shout for joy, all you upright in heart. So David, he wrote this psalm. And before unpacking this psalm, I think it would be helpful to unpack the story that leads up to this psalm. So if you're un- unfamiliar with David's life, I mean, here, here's his life in short. His life takes a major turn in, the, in Scripture in 2 Samuel 11. Leading up to that, uh, David had been anointed as the next king of Israel at the age of 15. I mean, imagine that, being 15 years old and being told, you're going to be the next king of Israel. Very soon after that, like 
either within the same year or the next year, is when he goes and he fights Goliath. So like God's hand was on David's life. In fact, 1 Samuel 18 says, David had success in all of his undertakings for the Lord was with him. 1 Chronicles 11, I love what it says here. 1 Chronicles 11, 9 says, and David became greater and greater. Why? For the Lord of hosts was with him. That, that title, Lord of hosts, uh, more um, literally translated would be Lord of angel armies. I mean, he was having success because the Lord who oversees and leads and conducts the army of angels was with David. Like, what a powerful picture. This is why he had success. And, and so because of David's battle victories, the people started to basically view him like a superhero, which, pause for a second, uh, a few weeks ago in my connection group, afterwards, me and some of the guys, we were talking, and I don't know why it came up, but they start talking about Marvel movies. Uh, anybody here, are y'all like Marvel movie people? Anybody Marvel movie? Okay, I hate Marvel movies, all right? <laughs> I think they're stupid. And... Uh, and, and I expressed that in the conversation. So like, if you just raise your hand, like, all right, cool. You know, uh, as a brother in Christ, I love you. I don't necessarily like you though, because um, I'm not a fan of Marvel movies. So, and you probably like different stuff than me. But anyways, so we're talking about Marvel movies and I said, I didn't like them. And, and so a few days later is when I have this whole appendix thing go down and I realized, all right, I'm stuck in my bedroom for the next couple of days as I'm like laying here. So I'll give one of these a shot, you know? And so I texted the guys and I was like, all right, if you're trying to get somebody hooked on Marvel movies, What's the first movie I should watch? Which, by the way, before I tell you what they said, what would you say? First movie I should watch if you want me to get hooked on Marvel. Okay, I heard Iron Man. What else did I hear? Thor. What? Rag what? <laughs> Thor, rag something. Okay. All right. Well, they said Iron Man. So I watched Iron Man. You guys seen Iron Man? All right. What'd you think? Okay, it's, you know, it's not the worst movie I've ever seen. It's still not a great movie. There's some big gaps in the plot of that movie, all right? It's just, it, I'm like, dude, this is stupid. Why did they let them sit in the cave and build, like, why didn't they just put one of the guys in the cave to say, hey, don't build this Iron Man suit? But anyways, all right, moving on. You know, the movie's about superheroes, and I'm, 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 I'm seeing those movies, and I'm thinking about the story of David. Like, man, he was like a superhero. The, the people started to view him like a superhero to the point they're throwing parades for this guy. I mean, he had... Everything going in his favor. Now, don't get me wrong. David went through some stuff, but God always came through for David. He had everything. He had the favor of God. He had the favor of man. But then 2 Samuel 11. You know what happens in 2 Samuel 11? If you don't, let me tell you. Bathsheba. So, so it was springtime, and David had sent his army out to battle to take more ground for his kingdom. And he didn't go out with him. Instead, he stayed back. And there's this one day, he goes up on the roof of his palace, and he sees bathing on the roof of a house next door, this woman named Bathsheba. And he was attracted to her. And so he abuses his power as king. He sends some of his servants to go get Bathsheba. And he brings Bathsheba to his palace and he sleeps with her. And, and in this moment of major weakness, David makes this decision that would stain him the rest of his life. I mean, with one quick, foolish choice, he threw away all that he had in the favor of man and in the favor of God for a very cheap, short-lived moment of pleasure. And I'd imagine it was one of those mistakes where, I mean, as soon as it happened, he knew it. As soon as it happened, he felt it. And, and let's just be specific here. This is especially true when it comes to sex. Like, like when it comes to sex, you're not thinking with your head. And, and the moment that sexual release has happened, it's like, oh my gosh, you can, also, you can, you can like almost immediately see straight. And you know the mistake that you've made. And you feel the guilt. And to make things worse, so he sends her back home. And you know, presumably this is something that he can just keep hidden. But then Bathsheba calls up and says, hey, I'm pregnant. And so what does he do at this point? Like he could have brought it into the light, dealt with the sin, but instead he doubles down on the sin. So things get worse. Now, Bathsheba, she was married to this dude named Uriah who was out on the battlefield. And so he's like, all right, here's how I can cover this up. I'll bring Uriah back and I'll set the mood for him and Bathsheba and surely they'll sleep together. And then when she's pregnant later on, uh, everybody will think it's Uriah's kid. So he brings Uriah back, sets the mood, but Uriah is such a man of character that he, he's like, I won't even go in the house with this woman. I, I'm not gonna enjoy the pleasure of my wife while my brothers are on the battlefield fighting for theirs. And so, or fighting for their life. And so he, he doesn't even go in the house. He sleeps outside. So that backfires. 
So now he doesn't double down, he triples down on his sin. So he sends Uriah back out to the battlefield. And what does he do? He tells his commanders of his armies uh, to put Uriah on the front line and then pull the front line back so it makes Uriah an easy target and so he's killed. And that's exactly what happens. So, so David, he commits adultery. Then, trying to cover it up, he commits murder. And then he lies about it. Now let's just stop there for a second because, I mean, I think... Uh, and again, as I was like writing this, before writing this, like I've, I felt this heavy burden believing that there are quite possibly many people, even in this room, who can relate to David's story. Like, you, you have it all, or you had it all. Job, family, um, scholarship, you had it all. And you threw it all away for a comparatively cheap moment of pleasure. Or you're throwing it all away, actively for a comparatively cheap moment of pleasure. And maybe nobody knows about it yet, but you know that if people found out, it would ruin everything. And so you've worked really hard to numb yourself to the shame, the guilt, the fear, but anytime that truth creeps back into your view, it buries you under its weight. And so I want you to listen to what, what this psalm says to you. So verse one, it says, blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity and in whose spirit there is no deceit. So first, right out of the gate, right out of the gate you see that word blessed, which by the way, are you a, I noticed Aaron when she read this, she's a blessed person. Did you catch that? When you read this in the Bible, do you say blessed or do you say blessed? How many blessed people are there? Like blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the meek. How many blessed people? Okay, well, grammatically you're wrong. Um, <laughs> it is blessed. Uh, but that's cool. I don't understand why, uh, I, I used to do this too. I don't understand why, you know, when reading the Bible and that word blessed, we suddenly become snobby British people and say blessed, you know, when we read it. But uh, I'm told grammatically that's incorrect. So anyways, you see this word blessed or blessed. And that could probably pretty literally be translated as happy or filled with joy. And the image that it's given us is I mean, picture like when you suddenly have this weight just lifted off of your back and you just feel free. Like that, that feeling you get after you turn in a big project at work. Or that feeling you get after you submit a paper that you've been working on forever, you submit this test that you've been studying for forever. Or that feeling you get at the end of the semester when school's out for like three months and you're just like, ah. Oh. Like you, you walk differently because you just feel weightless. Like that feeling that I got when they said, you're having surgery, it's your appendix, it's not just gas, you don't have to go home, you know, walk ashamed to your wife, and I call Leslie, I'm like, ha it's surgery, I really, I'm not a wimp, you know? Like that feeling you get, it just lifts this weight off your shoulders. That's the image, uh, that's the image here. But you, but you keep reading. It says, blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. Here's what I want you to see. There's, there's four different words that David uses to talk about sin. Did you notice that? He uses the words transgression. He uses the word sin. He uses the word iniquity. And he uses the word deceit. It's almost like David is holding sin in his hand and like observing it from all these different angles. Um, so I told you I have two boys. My three-year-old boy, his name's Trace. He's he is fearless and fun. And a couple weeks ago, we're standing in our backyard. I was grilling, and, uh, and this huge frog just comes hopping through our backyard. And Trace, uh, man, when it comes to critters, he's all about it. He's like the other day, just yesterday, he brought these spiders into the house. He's like, Mom, check out these spiders. And it's like, dude, what are you doing? Those are poisonous. Get them out of the house, you know? Um, we were digging around for worms the other day in our, in our backyard, uh, my older son and my older daughter, and Trace comes walking over, and he just grabs one and he eats it, like he's just crazy. Um, there's these little baby frogs, that, uh, thousands of them in this part near our house, like t tiny ones. And uh, my, son had a, my older son had a birthday party and so all these kids are trying to catch all these baby frogs and Trace is walking around with this Capri Sun. You know, they got those little orange straws or yellow straws. He pulls the straw and he starts, he starts, he starts squishing all these little frogs, you know? It's like frog juice everywhere. And I'm like, dude, you can't do that. And he's like, oh, I'm sorry. He puts his straw right back into his Capri Sun and starts drinking again. But anyways. He grabs this frog in our backyard. It's huge. And, uh, and immediately I'm grilling and he runs over to the grill and I'm like, Trace, don't do it. 
And he's like looking at the frog, looking at the grill. I'm like, Trace, bad idea. Looks at the frog, looks at the grill. He's like, don't do it, dude. He's like, you can tell he's like, okay, I'm not going to do it. But then he takes the frog and he starts like just looking at it, picking it up, flips it over on his back. And he's like poking at its throat and like poking in its belly and pulling its legs and just flips it back over, poking his eyes and like, I mean, torturing this frog. But in his mind, he's, he's investigating. Like he's, he's trying to understand this thing. He's doing his little like, biological experiment, trying to figure out what a frog really is. Looking at it from all these different angles. And it feels like David's doing the same thing with our sin. He's picking it up and he's looking at it from all these different angles. That's why he uses these different words. I mean, look at these words, trans, transgression. I mean, the, the connotation of the word is, it's, it's rebellion. It's a crime. It's a crime committed against God. It's a trespass committed against God. It's breaking his law. It's guilty in God's uh, court of divine or cosmic justice. That's transgression. And then he just says the word sin. It's a more broad term, but it's, but it's like this deliberate offense. And when we think about our sin and who it offends, like we probably think about, you know, our spouse or our parents or our kids or whoever we sinned against. But the reality is our sin is really more so an offense against God. Uh, and then he calls it Iniquity, and that word iniquity carries with it this connotation of missing the mark. Like imagine a bow and an arrow, and you're shooting at a target, and you shoot it, and, and you miss the bullseye by a few inches. Like you're missing the mark. That's the picture. You've missed the mark of God's standard of righteousness. And then he says deceit, which is like falsehood or his hypocrisy. Now when it comes to our sin, we like to numb ourselves to our sin. We don't want to feel it. Like when I was in the hospital, you know, they're always asking you, what's your pain level right now? Like one to 10, you know? And when I got there, honestly, it wasn't very high. I just knew something wasn't right, but I didn't want them to like ignore me. So I said, I don't know, it's at least a five or a six, even though it's probably like a two or a three. But there got, there got to a point where my pain just like skyrocketed and it was like 10 plus. And thankfully, Leslie had just gotten there and I was like, dude, you got to go get the doctor. I need something. And they were like, what's your pain at? 10 plus, I need something. And so they shot me with some morphine and just numbed me to the pain. That's how we like to treat our sin. We don't want to feel it. So we numb ourselves to it. We like to stuff our sin. But truthfully, we should spend more time staring at our sin. In fact, if you just want to write something down, I think this is good to write down. Don't stuff your sin, stare at it. Don't stuff your sin, stare at it. Now some of you are like, whoa, 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 hold up. Like that's not what we're normally taught. Like that doesn't feel like the gospel. You know, I, I want the good news. No, I'm telling you, don't stuff your sin. You need to stare at it. If we have a small view of our sin, then we, we will feel a small need for God's grace. Don't stuff your sin, stare at it. Jesus says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Like Jesus himself, what he's saying there is he's saying, man, blessed are those who see their sin clearly. Like realize how depraved and destitute they are because of their sin. Like, they're the ones ready to receive the gospel. Don't stuff your sin, stare at it. Here's an even bigger truth that we see coming from this where David's naming all these different uh, words for sin. Whether you, whether you fully see your sin or not, God does. Whether you fully see your sin or not, God does. He knows it from every angle. And he sees it clearly. Which is what makes the next thing we see here in Psalm 32, I think, pretty incredible. You, you look again at verses 1 and 2. He says, blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity and in whose spirit there is no deceit. So more than just seeing our sin from all these different angles, we are seeing God's grace and his power to deal with our sin from all of these different angles. Look at, look at the words that he uses. He says, forgiven. You see that? In fact, I've circled these in my Bible. He says, he says forgiven. He says, he says, covered. And he says, counts. So that word forgiven, it means to lift or to carry or to bear it or to take away. So in other words, he's saying, blessed is the one who has had the weight of their sin lifted off of their back. That's what he's saying. The weight of sin it can be crushing. And some of you, you feel crushed by the weight of your sin. And man, when, the, when that weight is lifted off of your back, the feeling of having it lifted off your back is indescribable. So in he's saying, blessed is the one who's had the weight of their sin removed, forgiven. 
then he says, blessed is the one whose sin has been covered. That word covered, it means to conceal or to hide or to clothe. So think back to Genesis 3. In Genesis 3, when Adam and Eve sinned, do you remember what they did? Like suddenly they realized that they were naked. So when they realized that they were naked, what did they do? Do you remember what they did? They, they hid. Like they, they tried to cover themselves up. Why did they, why did they try to cover themselves up? Why'd they try to cover themselves up? They, they, yeah, they felt exposed. They, they felt shame in their nakedness. They felt shame. And so in other words, when it says, your sin has been covered, he's saying, blessed is the one who's had the shame of their sin hidden. So what if I told you <clears throat> that Tree Line Church has been watching you and recording your life that's why they get their inform your information from you. So then they just swatch you and record your life. What if I told you they've been record? They don't do that. But what if I told you that they've been like recording your life, everything, even the secret stuff? And what if I said that this morning, um, we're, we, we picked three of you. And on these screens, we're going to show some of the secret parts of your life to everybody. Because we've been recording it. Austin, we've been recording. There's a lot of people here named Austin. We've been recording it. Austin, we're going to put your secret life up here. What if, what if we said, we're going to show all your secret sin to this whole room? I mean, how would you feel if, if that was about to happen? I mean, even as I'm just jokingly saying this, some of you are like, oof, like your heart sinks. Like you suddenly feel this, this shame, this humiliation. To say that your sin has been covered is to say, blessed is the one who no longer has to feel shame over their sin. And then he says, blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity. That word counts, it's an accounting term. It means to, means to, it means to compute. It means to reckon. So in other words, blessed is the one who's had the debt of their sin paid for. It's a money term. You know, for, for many, the crushing debt that we feel when we sin is towards, again, towards like our spouse or towards our kids or our, or our parents or our professor or our roommate or whoever. This is where staring at your sin and not stuffing it becomes very critical. Because when we see our sin, like the greatest offense we realize is against God. Therefore, the greatest debt that we owe, it's, it's to him. We've been found guilty in his court. And therefore, we must serve the sentence that he requires. And, and we know that scripture says the sentence for our sin is death. So in saying, blessed is the one against whom the Lord counts no iniquity, is to say, blessed is the one whose sin debt has been paid for. And by the way, this is what Jesus accomplished for us on the cross. You can even literally see this in what he did when he went to the cross. Like when he went to the cross, the cross that was meant for us was thrown on his back and he carried it instead of us. Like he bore the weight of our sin, lifting it off of us and throwing it on himself. When he went to the cross, he was stripped naked. You remember that in the story? On the account of Jesus dying, he was stripped naked so that we could be covered up and clothed. When Jesus went to the cross, his death paid for our sin debt. In fact, uh, in fact Colossians 2, uh, starting in verse 13 says, And you who were dead in your trespasses in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside. How? Nailing it to the cross. This is what we have in Jesus. Blessed is the one who's experienced the grace of God. We're blessed because God knows exactly what we've done. He has seen our sin for what it really is, and yet in Christ, he still forgives our trespasses. And yet in Christ, he still covers our sin. In Christ, he still counts not our iniquity against us. If you are in Christ, you have this, but this is a good place to pause. Because there's two kinds of people in this room who are not experiencing this kind of freedom. There's two kinds of people in this room right now who are not experiencing this kind of freedom. Number one, there's those who don't yet know Jesus and have never known Jesus. And you need to understand, you cannot experience this kind of freedom from sin until you've put your faith and trust in Jesus. The second kind of person in this room who's not experiencing this freedom is, is the one, yeah, you know Jesus but you have fallen into sin and instead of continuing to trust the Lord with your sin 
In your shame, you're keeping it covered up instead of bringing it into the light. And I just want to tell you, my heart is especially burdened for person number two. Because I know in a room this size, there are quite a few people who this describes you. Yes, you know Jesus. But as you've fallen back into patterns of sin or continue to walk in patterns of sin, instead of trusting the Lord with it and continuing to bring it to him, you're covering it up. And, and instead of letting him carry the weight, you're carrying the weight. And so I want to keep reading. I want to show you what it says next. Verse three, he says, for when I kept silent, my bones wasted away. Through my groaning all day long, for day and night, your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. So David, he takes a moment here to remember what it was like when he hadn't told anybody what he'd done. And we know that it was somewhere between nine and 12 months that he carried this sin of adultery and murder. Uh, he carried it secretly to himself. Eventually, he was confronted by this dude named Nathan, and, and that's when it was brought to light. But listen again to how he describes how he felt when he was concealing his sin. He says, when I kept silent, when I concealed my sin, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night, your hand, God's hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. This isn't the only place that he talks about this. In fact, if you turn a few pages to the left, uh, Psalm chapter six, he describes it in even more detail. We're gonna throw it up on the screen. But Psalm chapter, chapter six, listen, he says, "'Oh Lord, rebuke me not in your anger, "'nor discipline me in your wrath. "'Be gracious to me, O Lord, for, "'or because I am languishing. "'I'm languishing, I'm suffering. "'Heal me, O Lord, for my bones are troubled. "'My soul also is greatly troubled. "'But you, O Lord, how long? Turn, O Lord, deliver my life. Save me for the sake of your steadfast love. For in death there is no remembrance of you. And Sheol, who will give you praise? I'm weary. I'm weary with my moaning. Every night I flood my bed with tears. I drench my couch with weeping. My eye wastes away because of grief. It grows weak because of all my foes. And you can keep reading. You see the pain that he was feeling as he concealed his sin. And notice the stark difference, Psalm 32. Notice the, the difference between verses one and two and verses three and four. Verses one and two, he says, this person is blessed, happy, weightless, doesn't feel the shame and the guilt of their sin. Verses three and four, he uses words like, my bones are troubled. I can't sleep. I'm up at night. Can't stop thinking about it. Can't stop feeling it. And coming into this message, I've felt really burdened for those in this room who relate more of verses three and four than verses one and two. I mean, some of you, some of you, you've never felt the grace and forgiveness of the Lord, but you, you, you do feel the emptiness and the weight of your sin. Some of you, you remember the day when you could relate to verses one and two, but it's been a long time since you've been in that place because even though Jesus has saved you, you've fallen into sin and it's weighing you down. There's a line in verse four I want to look at more closely. Look at verse four again. He says, for when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. Verse four, for day and night, your hand was heavy upon me. He says, for day and night, your hand was heavy upon me. Let's talk about conviction of sin for a minute. David makes a clear connection here between God and the guilt that he was feeling over his sin. He says, for day and night, your hand, God, was heavy upon me. Like, I'm feeling guilt, and, and he's connecting it to God's work in his life. Now, that may, might make you feel uncomfortable for, for me to say that, but you need to know that not all guilt is bad. In fact, oftentimes, guilt actually comes from God. I'll steal a line from a pastor that I love to listen to. He says this, guilt can be God's messenger. Guilt can be God's messenger. It's kind of like pain. You know, not all pain is bad pain. Like the pain that you feel when you touch a hot stove, like that pain is, it, it's a good thing. It's telling you, dude, if you keep doing this, you're gonna hurt your body. Um, like the pain that I felt when 
uh, my appendix was doing its thing. Like when I got to that 10, they gave me the, the, the morphine. Something crazy happened. Like, it was wild. Like I started to black out. My hearing went away. Uh, in like seconds, I just drenched the chair I was sitting in sweat. So much that they had to take towels afterwards and like clean my chair off. Like I was in so much pain. Pain, not all pain is bad. That pain in my body when my appendix was about to burst was a good thing. It was telling me, look, if you don't deal with this, if you don't tell somebody then it's gonna be really bad for you. Guilt can be God's messenger. Not only can guilt be God's messenger, guilt is often evidence of God's pursuit of you. Guilt is often evidence of God's pursuit of you. Uh, You know the lyrics to the song Amazing Grace? Everybody knows that song. Really, everybody knows the first stanza to that song. So the first stanza, Amazing Grace, How Sweet the Sound, The Saved Wretch Like Me, I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. Okay, everybody knows the first stanza. Most don't know the next part of the song. And if you do, you've probably never really thought about what it says. The next line in that song says this, "'Twas grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved." Listen to that, he says, "'Twas grace that taught my heart to fear. We don't typically think of grace as something that makes us afraid. But the truth is, a huge part of God's grace is him opening our eyes to see our sin for what it really is. And when we're able to see our sin for what it really is, man, that's when we feel conviction. And when we feel conviction, oftentimes we feel fear of condemnation. Like we... It, hurt, it hurts. So we, we know we need help. We know we need healing. We know we need the healer. And I believe that this is exactly where God has some of you this morning. You are sitting under the weight of God's conviction in your heart. And if that's you, you, you gotta know two things. Number one, God is trying to send you a message. Guilt is often God's messenger. And number two, God is likely pursuing you. Guilt is often evidence of God's pursuit. And so look at what David says next. Verse five, he says, I acknowledge my sin to you and I did not cover my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Now I want you to circle this line in here. He says, and I did not cover my iniquity. I've, I've circled that in my Bible right there. I, if you've got, you got a pen, circle it. He says, I did not cover my iniquity. Now, hold that thought and go back to verse one. <laughs> Look at verse, what, what, what verse one says. He says, blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is what? Whose sin is covered. Blessed is the one whose sin is covered. But then in verse five, he says, I did not cover my iniquity. I want you to understand what's happening here. Like when we sin, Our natural response is to what? We want to cover it up. Think back to Genesis 3 again. So Genesis 3, what happened the moment they sinned? Verse 7, Genesis 3 says this. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And so what did they do? It says, they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. And then it says they hid themselves from God. Like normal people, I say normal people because, I don't know, there's weird people today that don't feel this way, apparently. It's all over Instagram. Normal people don't want others to see them naked. Because when we're naked, other people can see every single blemish on our body, right? Like you don't want, to, you don't want, you don't want people to see you naked because they can see every little blemish on your body. Like that's why some of you have that recurring dream where you show up to school, you show up to work naked, and you, anybody? Okay, thank you. I'm glad there's some admittance to that. I have that dream. I've had the dream that I've shown up to preach naked. And I'm telling you, when you wake up from that dream, how do you feel? You're like, oh, so relieved. Why? I mean, one, because if you show up to work naked, you're going to go to prison. But two, man, you feel shame when you show up. And it's like everybody can see every blemish on your body. Well, in the same way that we don't want people to see us physically naked, man, we don't want, to see, we don't want people to see us spiritually naked. 
Because if people can see us fully exposed, they can see every blemish in our life. So what do we do? Well, we try to cover it up. But again, look at verse five. Verse five, he says, I did not cover my iniquity. And again, compare that to verse one. Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is what? Whose sin is what? Whose sin is covered. Here's the irony. If you want your sin to be covered, you must first uncover your sin. If you want your sin to be covered, you must first uncover your sin. Think back to Genesis 3 again. What did God do? He called them out from hiding. He forced them to uncover themselves. Then he dealt with their sin. He killed an animal, made them clothes to cover their nakedness. Uh, to quote this other pastor again, cover your sin and God will expose it. Expose your sin and God will cover it. Cover your sin and God will expose it. Expose your sin and, co- and God will cover it. And, and, and you know, again, what, what God did in Genesis 3 was only foreshadowing what he'd ultimately do for us in Jesus. He killed his son, Jesus, so that we could be covered and clothed in his righteousness, which leads to the question, okay, so how do you uncover your sin? How do you uncover your sin? We'll go back to verse five. He says, I acknowledged my sin to you. I didn't cover it up. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. How do you uncover your sin? You acknowledge it and you confess it. Acknowledge and confess. First John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And then you read on, verse, verse six through 11. I'll just read it real quick. It says, therefore, let everyone who's godly offer prayer to you at a time when you may be found. Surely in the rush of great waters, they shall not reach him. They're a hiding place for me. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with shouts of deliverance. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. Be not like a horse or a mule without understanding, which must be curbed with bit and bridle, or it won't stay near you. Many are the sorrows of the wicked, but steadfast love surrounds the one who trusts in the Lord. Be glad in the Lord. Rejoice, O righteous, and shout for joy, all you upright in heart. So this psalm, it ultimately gives us two pictures. The first picture is of the one who confesses their sin the one who uncovers their sin so God can cover it. This person is blessed. They're blessed, free from the weight of their sin, free from the shame of their sin, and free from the debt of their sin. That's the first picture. The second picture is of somebody who conceals their sin. They're the one who covers it up. That's verses three and four. Ultimately, what this psalm comes down to is this. Are you going to conceal your sin Or are you going to confess your sin? And let me just tell you why I feel so burdened by this. You gotta zoom out and see the bigger picture. Again, the context in which this psalm was written. You have David. This dude had committed adultery. Maybe even maybe even worse. Like, I mean, maybe he raped this woman, I don't know. But on top of that, he he kills her husband. So he commits adultery and he commits murder. Like, how do you come back from that? And yet, in taking it to the Lord, he found freedom and forgiveness. You need to know there's real consequences for your sin. And and many of you, you feel that, you felt that, you're going to feel that. But you feel the fear that, man, God's grace is not for you because of the level of sin you've committed. And look at David's story. And listen to this psalm. Man, there's no sin too heavy that God's grace can't lift off of your record. Man, there's no sin too big that God's grace can't cover. And there's no sin too costly that God's grace can't pay for in Christ. So again, you look at verses one and two. Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity. In other words, blessed is the one who does not conceal their sin, but confesses it. And so that's what this comes down to. Conceal or confess. Conceal or confess. Continue to sit under the weight of sin or walk in freedom from it. What is it that God is convicting you of to bring into the light this morning? 
Here's how I want to end. At the end of Psalm 139, uh, there's this great prayer, and I just, I just want to pray this over us as we close. Psalm 139 ends by saying, Lord, search me and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. See if there be any grievous way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. I want to pray this over us, and I, I want to invite you to pray that just for yourself. Lord, I, I thank you so much for this group of people in this room this morning, and I I know you know exactly where each one is right now. And so, Lord, the prayer is, starting with me, would you search, would you search me and would you know my heart? Lord, would you search me and would you know my heart? Lord, would you try me and would you know my thoughts? Lord, would you search us in this room? Peel back the layers of our heart. Expose what's deeply hidden underneath. Try us. Know our thoughts. Lord, did you see if there's any grievous way in us? And Lord, would you lead us in the way everlasting? Man, I just want you to sit with that prayer for a moment. As you ask the Lord that question, God, search my heart. Know my heart. Show me what's there. Now, what's God showing you? What's he showing you as you ask that question? You know, my guess is that coming out of today, uh, the Lord's going to move some of you towards confessing sin, bringing it into the light, which will likely mean not only taking it before the Lord, but also taking it to your spouse or taking it to your parents or taking it to your roommate or your friend or you know whoever. But here's what I want to encourage you with. Can I encourage you to just maybe take the first step right now in this moment and simply acknowledge before the Lord their sin that you've been concealing and need to confess. In fact, just everybody's eyes closed. Uh, I, I just want to ask this. Is there anybody in this room who it's like, man, the Lord is convicting your heart this morning. Maybe you came in knowing it. Or maybe, maybe you came in here and the Lord has brought back to the surface of your life this sin that you've tried to pack away and numb yourself to for a long time and he's convicting you of it. Is there anybody in here in the room this morning who just would be willing to stick your hand up and just say, hey, I, I feel like the Lord is con convicting me right now that there's sin I'm concealing that I need to confess. Would you just put your hand up in the air for a second? Lord, I just want to pray for those who just put their hands up. Lord, I pray that you would, as that Psalm 139 says, lead them in the way everlasting. Lord, would you show them, give them the courage to take the step of bringing that sin into the light, confessing it to whom it needs to be confessed. And Lord, I pray that as they no longer keep silent, that you would let verses one and two of Psalm 32 be their experience, blessed, feeling the weight lifted off their shoulders, feeling the shame taken away, feeling the, the debt removed in their life. And Lord, for those who didn't raise their hand, know they should have raised their hand but are still concealing their sin, Lord, I pray that you would give them such strong conviction that they can't sleep at night until they can confess. I pray that your spirit would do the work in their hearts in such a way uh, that they just would not be able to go to sleep until they confess and as a result be met with your grace that can only be found in Christ. Lord, we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand. Let's sing.